Hey everyone, this is Dr. Marcon, and this is the uh, lecture on Chapter 24, the Urinary System. So there are main important functions of the kidneys. Uh, those functions include maintaining the chemical consistency of the blood, filters many liters of fluid from blood, sends toxins, metabolic wastes, and excess water out of the body. Now the main waste products are three nitrogenous compounds, and these compounds are urea, uric acid, and creatinine. These are the main organs of the urinary system. These include the kidneys, the ureters, urinary bladder, and the urethra. So there are two kidneys, two ureters, one urinary bladder, one urethra, where urine will, uh, will leave the body. Here is a gross picture of the abdomen showing the kidneys as well as a diagram. So we can see that there are two kidneys, right and left. And the kidneys, of course, have their blood supply. They have their uh, renal arteries coming as direct branches off of the abdominal aorta. And uh, uh, deoxygenated blood will be um, taken away from the kidneys via the uh, renal veins, which um, drain into the inferior vena cava. So we have our right and left kidney. Notice that the right kidney, um, normally the right kidney is slightly a little bit lower than the left kidney and that's because we have the right lobe of the liver which is a lot larger compared to the left lobe of the liver. Sitting on top of the kidneys are two very important glands. These are the adrenal glands um, and then we will discuss further um, anatomical parts of the kidney in just a little bit. And then you have the ureters um, that drain urine from the kidney and will empty into the urinary bladder. And once the urinary bladder is full, we then have um, micturition or voiding or urination and the urine will leave the body via the urethra. Kidneys are red-brown in color. They are located retroperitoneally. We talked about organs that were uh, retroperitoneal, meaning they are behind the peritoneal cavity. So behind the peritoneum, they are lateral to vertebral levels T12 to L3. Now the average kidney is about 12 centimeters tall, 6 centimeters wide, and 3 centimeters uh, thick. So we talked about... Um, the structure called the hilum. There are many organs that have a hilum. Uh, we talked about the lungs having a hilum. Again, a hilum is just a structure where vessels will enter and exit the organ. Um, so we talked about the lungs having a hilum. Um, in a little bit, we'll talk about the spleen having a hilum and the kidneys have a hilum. This is where the uh, renal artery and renal vein will enter and exit the kidney. Um, so again, hilum is a concave surface where vessels and nerves will enter and exit the organ. The kidney has several layers that cover it. Um, first, we have a fibrous capsule. Uh, this is the capsule of dense connective tissue that surrounds the kidney. It's important because it helps inhibit the spread of infections. Then there is a perirenal fat capsule, which is outside of the renal capsule um, or external to the renal capsule and just um, a layer of fat basically surrounding the kidney. And then there is renal fascia. We know that fascia is made up of connective tissue. This renal fascia is external to the perirenal fat capsule, um, also contains fat. And this posterior uh, wall picture, we can see the location of the kidneys. Again, we're saying that um, the kidneys are around vertebral level T12 to L3. So here we see this border of the 12th rib and it goes just a little bit below, the kidneys go a little bit below the border of the 12th rib. This picture just shows the position of the kidneys um, within the, uh, that are retroperitoneal, so behind this peritoneal cavity. Um, we can see the kidneys here and their different uh, layers. So the first 
uh, layer surrounding the kidney is that renal uh, or fibrous capsule. And then we have the layer of the perirenal fat capsule, and then that is surrounded by the renal fascia. Okay, so this um, just showing the retroperitoneal uh, location of the kidneys compared to uh, the peritoneal cavity. Here, the peritoneal cavity are, uh, and uh, have the organs removed. And just a CT scan showing you the location of the kidneys again. Um, we can see part of the liver, um, and we see that this is around vertebral level L1. So here is the left kidney, here is the right kidney. So with regards to internal gross anatomy of the kidneys, if we do a frontal section through the kidney, we can see the different layers uh, that make up the internal part of the kidney. The outermost layer, and like most structures, the outermost layer is a cortex. So the renal cortex is the outermost layer, so it's the superficial region, has a granular appearance. The uh, innermost layer is the medulla. So the rena medulla uh, consists of cone-shaped renal pyramids, and between these pyramids we have renal columns. Um, at the apex, or the papilla of these pyramids, the urine will drain into um, structures called calyces. So first the um, urine will drain into a minor calyx. Calyx, C-A-L-Y-X, is singular. Uh, and a bunch of minor calyces will then drain into a major calyx, and a group of major calyces will then drain into the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis will then exit the hilum of the kidney, become ureters, and urine will uh, be transported towards the urinary bladder. For vasculature, the renal arteries um, coming off of the abdominal aorta will branch into segmental arteries. Uh, the segmental arteries will then branch into interlobar arteries, and then these interlobar arteries become ar arcuate arteries. So this is just a frontal section of the kidney. We can see the different layers. We can see the renal cortex granular in appearance. And then we see the inner uh, layer called the renal medulla. So the re renal medulla, we see these dark shaped pyramid structures. These are the renal pyramids. In between the renal pyramids are the renal columns, just basically projections of the cortex. So we see these columns between these darker pyramids. Now the pyramids have an apex or what they call a papilla of the pyramid. So the pointy part of the pyramid will drain into a minor calyx, okay? So these um, uh, structures are minor calyces. So a bunch of minor calyces will then drain into a major calyx, okay? So we have major calyces, which will then drain into the renal pelvis. You can see the renal pelvis here, just a, a dilation where um, the major calyces will converge. The renal pelvis will then exit the, the kidney at the hilum, the renal hilum, and then eventually become uh, the ureter where urine will be transported towards the urinary bladder. And this picture just shows the blood vessels of the kidney. So starting off with um, the renal artery coming off of the abdominal aorta, the renal artery will then branch into segmental arteries, okay? And then the segmental arteries will become interlobar arteries. The interlobar arteries will become uh, arcuate arteries, so sort of these arching at the base of the renal pyramid, and then the arcuate arteries will then become the uh, cortical radiate arteries, okay? And the cortical radiate arteries will then drain into the afferent glomerular arterial uh, to then um, participate and become the glomerulus. The glomerulus being that tuft of capillaries within the nephron where blood will be filtered and um, this filtrate will eventually either be reabsorbed or become urine.
So this just shows you the path of blood flow through the renal blood vessels. We talked about the arteries down to the glomerulus. Um, glomerulus, again, being that tuft of capillaries that is filtered by the nephron to either uh, resorb back the nutrients or form urine. So from the glomerulus, the capillaries will then become an efferent glomerular arterial moving away from the glomerulus. And the... Uh, efferent glomerular arterial will then uh, become the paratubal capillaries and vasor recta, um, which are associated with parts of the tubules of the nephron, and then uh, draining into the cortical radiate vein, arcuate veins, interlobar veins, the renal vein, which will then drain into the inferior vena cava. Nerve supply of the kidneys um, is the renal plexus, which is a network of autonomic fibers, an offshoot of the celiac plexus. It's supp supplied by sympathetic fibers um, from the lowest thoracic splanchnic nerve, as well as the first lumbar splanchnic nerve. So let's talk about the microscopic anatomy of the kidneys. The functional unit of the kidney is the nephron, and there are over 1 million nephrons in each kidney. The nephrons um, are basically there to start off and participate in urine production. So these are the functional units that produce urine. So mechanisms of urine production include filtration, resorption, and secretion. With filtration, filtrate of the blood will leave the kidney capillaries. Resorption, this is where most nutrients, water, and essential ions are reclaimed. Basically, 99% of what is filtered um, from the glomerulus will be resorbed back. Only 1% of that filtrate becomes uh, waste products, becomes urine. So 99% of the filtrate resorbed back, 1% becomes urine. And then secretion is an active process of removing undesirable molecules. So here is a nephron, and we'll talk about the parts of the nephron in just a little bit. So the nephron produces urine through the mechanisms of filtration, resorption, and secretion. So here at the glomerulus, um, so the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule make up the renal corpuscle. So at this structure, this is where we have um, glomerular filtration. So number one, here is glomerular filtration. This is when a uh, filtrate of the blood leaves the kidney capillaries. Again, the glomerulus being a tuft of capillaries. Um, so the filtrate leaves the glomerulus and enters the second part of the nephron, which is the renal tubule. Okay, so the this first part of the renal tubule being the proximal convoluted tubule. So the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule, again, being uh, directly associated with the next structure, which is the renal tubule. And specifically, this is the proximal convoluted tubule. So within the proximal convoluted tubule, uh, the filtrates, um, undergoes resorption. So the re filtrate resembles tissue fluid and will contain all the small molecules of blood plasma. And then 99% or most of the nutrients, water, and essential ions are recovered from the filtrate and returned to the blood capillaries and the surrounding connective tissue. So here are the paratubular ca uh, capillaries that resorb 99% of the renal volume filtrate. So the remaining 1% um, are uh, there to form uh, urine and undergo tubulars, um, will be added to the tubular secretion um, to form urine. So 1% of the um, waste uh, and unneeded substances will contribute to urine uh, secretion uh, by the paratubular capillaries moves additional undesirable molecules into the tubule from the blood of the surrounding capillaries, okay? And then that will eventually will become urine. So filtration occurring at the glomerulus, and then we have tubular resorption. 99% of what is filtered gets resorbed back and then into the capillaries. And then we have tubular secretion, um, unnecessary products or undesirable products are 
uh, secreted back into the tubules and that 1% becomes uh, urine. So let's talk about the nephron. Again, nephron being the functional unit of the kidney. And we have over a million nephrons per kidney. So the nephron is composed of two uh, main structures. We have, first we have the renal corpuscle, and we talked about the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is made up of the glomerulus, as well as the glomerular capsule, also known as Bowman's capsule. Again, if you discover it, you get to name it. So the renal corpuscle is that first part of the nephron, and then we have the renal tubule, uh, the renal tubule responsible for uh, the eventual formation of urine. So let's first talk about the renal corpuscle. So this is the first part of the nephron. Um, it includes the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. So the glomerulus, again, being that tuft of capillaries. Uh, and these capillaries are fenestrated, meaning they have holes, um, which allow for um, filtration. And then the second structure within the renal corpuscle is the glomerular or Bowman's capsule. And there are two layers to this capsule. Again, imagine your fist, and then imagine your hand kind of surrounding, your other hand surrounding that fist. So the hand surrounding your fist is the glomerular or Bowman's capsule. Um, and then there are two layers to that Bowman's capsule. You have the parietal layer, which is that outer layer. This layer is made up of a simple squamous epithelium. And then the visceral layer, again, visceral meaning organ, is a layer that adheres to the glomerulus. And the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule consists of podocytes. These are specialized cells that have foot processes and um, participate uh, in the filtration membrane, which we will talk about. So the filtration membrane, uh, this is a filter that lies between blood in the glomerulus and the capsular space, and it consists of three layers. First, we have the fenestrated endothelium of the capillary. Um, and then we have uh, the foot processes um, adhered to, um, and then they have foot processes um, and filtration slits between these foot processes. And then between these two layers is a basement membrane. We'll see a picture of that um, in just a little bit. So the basement membrane and slit diaphragm hold back most proteins, however, allow the passage of water ions, glucose, amino acids, and urea. Again, 99% of these are resorbed back um, into the paratubule cap, uh, capillaries. So here we see parts of the renal corpuscle. We have that tuft of capillaries being the glomerulus, and then surrounding it, sort of like your fist surround, or your hand surrounding your fist, uh, this is the glomerular or Bowman's capsule. And again, we have the two layers. We have the outer parietal layer, and then we have the inner visceral layer. Visceral meaning organ, so the visceral layer is that layer that adheres to the glomerulus. And then there's a capsular space between those two layers. Now, if we're talking about a fist and then your hands, your other hand surrounding that fist, your wrist going to your arm, that is the uh, start of the renal tubule, which is the next part of the nephron. And specifically, the uh, first part of the renal tubule that is associated with um, the glomerular capsule, and this is the proximal convoluted tubule. In the beginning of the year, we talked about proximal versus distal. So proximal being closest to. So the renal tubule closest to uh, the renal corpuscle is the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so filtrate will go from the capsule, uh, the glomerular capsule across the capsular space and then into the renal tubule, that first part being the proximal convoluted tubule. And this next picture just shows you um, the components of the filtration membrane. So first we have the fenestration of the capillaries within the glomerulus. Um, and then we have podocytes that make up the visceral layer um, of the Bowman's capsule. And then between the foot processes of the podocytes, we have these little filtration slits 
that allow for passage, okay? So the filtration membrane, again, is made up of three things. We have the fenestrated endothelium um, of the capillaries here. We have the filtration slits between the foot processes of the podocytes, which is covered by a thin slit diaphragm. And then we have a basement membrane. Um, you can't really see the basement membrane here. You'll see it in the next picture. The basement membrane consists of the fused basal lamina of the endothelium and the podocyte epithelium. Again, it has been removed in this picture, but you can actually see it here in this picture. So on the, on the right, for example, this would be the podocyte with the foot processes um, and the filtration slits between the foot processes of the podocyte that again those cells making up the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule and then in between the capillary and the podocyte here is that basement membrane this is the best basement membrane right here and then to the left is the capillary the glomerular capillary um, that is filtered uh, the blood is filtered and will go across the uh, fenestration pores um, of the capillary across the basement membrane um, and then through the filtration slits of the podocytes um, to be filtered. So again, those are the three parts of the filtration membrane. So from the renal corpuscle, filtrate will then enter the renal tubule. So filtrate proceeds to renal tubules from the glomerulus. Uh, the first part of the renal tubule we talked about is the proximal convoluted tubule. This is where the majority of resorption takes place. So 99% of the filtrate is resorbed. Uh, we then have more parts of the renal tubule. The second part is the nephron loop and we have different parts to the nephron loop. First we have that uh, limb that goes down. So this is the descending limb of the nephron loop. Uh, there's a descending thin limb and then the nephron loop will then uh, turn up and form the ascending limb, specifically the ascending thin limb, and then the thick ascending limb. For your uh, practical purposes in the next unit, you just have to be able to describe uh, the nephron loop, whether it's the descending limb or ascending limb. I'm not going to be too concerned about whether it's a thick or thin uh, limb or not. Just know that the loop that goes down is the descending limb and the loop that goes up is the ascending limb, okay? And then the ascending limb, once it crosses that border between the medulla and the cortex of the kidney, so once it goes back into the cortex, it becomes the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, and then all distant convoluted, distal convoluted tubule will then enter the next structure, which are the collecting ducts. So the collecting ducts receive urine from several nephrons. They play an important part in conserving body fluids. Um, for example, the hormone, antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin, um, has its effects on the collecting ducts. So posterior pituitary gland secretes vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone, which increases the permeability of the collecting ducts and distal convoluted tubules to water. Basically, antidiuretic hormone um, conserves water, so more water is resorbed and it concentrates urine. Okay, so it makes urine more concentrated because we are resorbing back the water and it's this hormone that has its effects on the collecting ducts and distal convoluted tubules. So here is a picture of an actual nephron and where it's located. So these blood vessels here form a border between the cortex, the outer uh, layer of the kidney, the outer renal cortex, as well as the inner layer, which is the renal medulla, okay? So in the cortex, you have um, your renal corpuscles, and these renal corpuscles um, can be named based on whether or not um, they're located closer to the medulla or more outer to the cortex. So we have cortical nephrons and we have nephrons that are juxtamedullary, meaning they're closer to that border between the cortex and the medulla. But we'll get into that in just a little bit. So within the cortex, we have um, 
parts of the nephron starting with the renal corpuscle. Again, the renal corpuscle made up of the glomerular capsule and the glomerulus. Um, this is where we have filtration of the, uh, the capillaries and the filtrate goes into the first part of the renal tubule, which is the proximal convoluted tubule, as you can see here. So this is the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, this is where uh, resorption takes place. 99% of the filtrate is resorbed. And then once it crosses into the medulla, it becomes the nephron loop. So that first part of the nephron loop being the descending limb. See that? So it descends or goes down into the medulla. It will then turn and go start going back up towards the cortex. While it's still in the medulla, this is the ascending limb of the nephron loop. Um, another name for the nephron loop is the loop of Henle. Henle is spelled H-E-N-L-E. -E. Again, if you discover it, you get to name it. But know that nephron loop and loop of Henle mean the same thing. So from the ascending limb, uh, the renal tubule will then enter the cortex and become the distal convoluted tubule. And all distal convoluted tubules will then drain into the collecting duct. When we talked about epithelium, we referred to the kidney, um, and the kidney had several examples of different epithelium. For example, the glomerular capsule. Uh, we know that the glomerular capsule has a layer of uh, simple squamous epithelium, so that one layer of squamous cells that make up um, the outer parietal layer of the glomerular capsule. And the majority of the tubules within the, uh, the nephron loop are simple cuboidal. Okay. And we saw lots of examples of simple cuboidal uh, epithelium uh, within the kidney. And we can actually see it on this next slide. So here we have the glomerulus, that tuft of capillaries that will be filtered into the, uh, the renal tubule. So again, glomerulus, uh, one of the two parts of the renal corpuscle. And then surrounding it is the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule. And that capsule made up of simple squamous epithelium. And then surrounding the glomerulus are the different uh, tubules that make up the renal tubule. So um, you're not expected to know which one's proximal convoluted tubule or distal convoluted tubule. But we know that these tubules are made up of a simple cuboidal epithelium. Again, just showing another histoslide of the different uh, epithelium that we can see within the, uh, the nephron. Now we have, um, as I mentioned before, we have different classes of nephrons based on where they are located um, within the cortex. So 85% of nephrons are located on the outer part of the cortex, so these are called cortical nephrons. There are about 15% of these nephrons that are located near the border of the cortex and the medulla. And these are called juxtamedullary nephrons. And we can see distinct differences between the cortical nephrons and the juxtamedullary nephrons. Uh, we, in lab, there are models of these nephrons and uh, the parts of the nephron um, that you guys will be studying next unit. So juxtamedullary nephrons um, make up about 15% of, of nephrons and contribute to the kidney's ability to concentrate urine. So in this next slide, you can actually see uh, distinct differences between the different types of nephrons. So for example, the cortical nephron, we see that the nephron loop within the cortex, or within the medulla, excuse me, is a lot shorter compared to the nephron loop of the juxtamedullary nephron. See that? And we know, again, the juxtamedullary nephron is the nephron that uh, contributes to the concentration of urine. Along with the, sh the length of the nephron loop between the two, the cortical nephron, again, is located more towards the outer part of the cortex. So if you see uh, this part of the nephron, the uh, renal corpuscle kind of being more towards the um, upper or outer part of the cortex, they are considered cortical nephrons. And again, they have a shorter nephron loop. Whereas the juxtamedullary nephrons, again, they're located more closer towards that border between the cortex and the medulla and have longer nephron loops there. Now, nephrons are associated closely with two capillary beds. We have the glomeruli, which we talked about, and then we have the peritubular capillaries 
um, in cortical nephrons or vasa recta in juxtamedullary nephrons. So paratubular capillaries um, are associated with cortical nephrons, vasa recta um, in juxtamedullary nephrons. Again, these capillaries are important for uh, filtration or resorption of the filtrate um, from the renal tubule as well as secretion of any um, waste products that the body doesn't need to help form that 1% um, of the filtrate that becomes urine. So again, glomeruli produce filtrate that will eventually become urine. They are fed and drained by arterioles, specifically um, glomeruli uh, accepting blood from the afferent glomerular arteriole and then uh, will then feed out into the efferent glomerular arteriole. The efferent or efferent arteriole has a smaller diameter than the afferent arteriole. Uh, we generate one liter of fluid every eight minutes. And again, 99% of the filtrate is resorbed by the tubules. The paratubular cavities arise from the efferent arterioles that drain the cortical glomeruli and are adapted for absorption. Uh, they have low pressure porous capillaries and then all molecules secreted by nephrons into urine are from paratubular capillaries. The vasa recta also continue from the efferent arterioles of the juxtamedullary nephrons. These are thin-walled looping vessels and descend into the medulla. They are also part of the kidney's urine concentrating mechanism. Juxtaglomerular juxta complex um, is important because it helps regulate uh, blood pressure. There is an air, it's an area of specialized contact between the terminal end of the ascending limb and the afferent arteriole. We have specific cells called granular cells. These are modified smooth muscle cells uh, with secretory granules that contain the hormone renin. Uh, renin is secreted in response to falling blood pressure in the afferent arteriole. Renin is important because it allows for the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 in the lungs. And this is important because this conversion allows for an increase in blood pressure. So renin, um, once these cells kind of, um, kind of sense from the um, arterioles that our blood pressure is low, um, renin will be released allowing for conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and then we have an increase in blood pressure. Now, note in pharmacology, we have drugs called angiotensin uh, converting enzyme um, or ACE inhibitors. So angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or ACE inhibitors block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. These drugs are responsible for helping to lower blood pressure. I know because my doctor once put me on ACE inhibitors, and unfortunately one of the side effects of taking ACE inhibitors is a dry cough. And when I started taking my ACE inhibitor, I could not stop coughing, and it was the most annoying thing ever. So I was like, nope, doc, um, I think I'm going to switch. So I no longer take ACE inhibitors. But again, renin is that hormone responsible for the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now the macula densa is found at the end of the nephron loop and adjacent to those granular cells. These are tall, closely packed epithelial cells that monitor solute concentration in the filtrates. These signal the granular cells to secrete renin and again initiates that renin-angiotensin mechanism. Mesangial cells are located around the base of the glomerulus, also help regulate blood flow within the glomerulus. We also have extra glomerular mesangial cells. These interact with the macula densa and granular cells to help regulate blood pressure. So again, kidneys are very important in the regulation of blood pressure. So here is that macula densa, which are close to the granular cells. Um, again, this whole complex, the juxtaglomerular complex, important in regulating blood pressure. If it senses a drop in blood pressure, it will, um, it will increase the release of the hormone renin, and renin, again, important in that renin-angiotensin um, uh, 
formation um, of angiotensin II so that we can increase blood pressure. So the next structures we're going to talk about are the ureters. Notice it's plural. That means there's two ureters, right and left. The ureters carry urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. An oblique entry into the bladder prevents backflow of urine. What does that mean? So basically, instead of going straight into the urinary bladder, they kind of enter in an oblique angle. I'm actually going to try to draw this because I haven't drawn it in a while. So here, for example, is a side of the urinary bladder. The ureters will enter at an oblique angle. So the oblique angle allows for the prevention of backflow of urine. So urine can't, you know, go straight back up into the ureters. We don't want that. All right, we're gonna erase that. Okay. So um, with regards to histological features of the ureter, the um, epithelium is a transitional epithelium. Remember, we talked about transitional epithelium being mostly in the urinary system. Uh, the ureters contain a muscularis layer with two layers. We have an inner longitudinal layer, an outer circular layer, and then the outer adventitia is typical connective tissue. Here we see a histological slide of the ureter. Again, we have that transitional epithelium uh, that looks like you know, they're dome-like um, sh in shape um, in a relaxed state. However, once it becomes distended, if this ureter becomes filled with urine, it will flatten. And then here are the two uh, layers within the muscularis, a longitudinal inner layer, circular outer layer, and then that connective tissue making up the adventitia. The urinary bladder is a collapsible, collapsible muscular sac. It stores and expels urine. When it is full, um, it becomes spherical in shape and expands into the abdominal cavity. When it is empty, it lies entirely within the pelvis. There are other structures of the urinary bladder. For example, at the apex or the anterior angle of the urinary bladder is a fibrous band called the urochus. I love this name, urochus. Um, this is a closed remnant um, of an embryonic tube called the allantois. So this was the urinary canal of the fetus. Now within males, they have a structure at the base of the urinary bladder called the prostate. So it lies directly inferior to the bladder um, and surrounds the part of the urethra uh, that immediately exits the bladder. And we'll see that in just a bit, prostate being important in the secretion of specific hormones, as well as um, to help uh, contribute to the formation of semen. Here in the male pelvis, we can see the urinary bladder, and at the apex of the urinary bladder is the urochus, um, again, being a remnant of the embryonic uh, urinary canal um, that has since closed. So we can see that here's part of the ureter kind of um, entering the posterior portion of the urinary bladder. And then um, the urinary bladder will then empty into a structure called the urethra. So this is the urethra. It's a lot longer in females because it has to um, transport urine out the penis. So surrounding this first portion of the uh, urethra exiting the bladder is the prostate gland. Again, prostate gland important because it, uh, its secretions um, contribute to the formation of semen. And within the prostate, we can see part of the ejaculatory duct, which we'll talk about when we go over male reproductive system. So the ejaculatory duct um, enters the prostate, which will then um, empty into this prostatic part of the urethra. Okay, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that when we get into male reproductive. So here we see in a female uh, patient a, a sagittal section. So uh, the urinary bladder is located anteriorly compared to the uterus. So this is the uterus here that kind of sits on top of the urinary bladder. Um, we can see a thick 
muscular wall of the urinary bladder. This is called detrusor muscle. Okay, detrusor muscle is the thick muscular layer of the urinary bladder. And again, in females, the urethra is a lot shorter, so it doesn't have very far to go. And from the uh, urethra, uh, urine that has been um, kind of sitting in the bladder can then be uh, voided or urinated out. Now, we know that the female urethra um, is a lot shorter. We also know that it is more prone to um, infections, especially ascending infections going from the urinary bladder up the ureters into the kidneys because of the shortness of this urethra. That's why, ladies, it's always important when you're going to the bathroom, always wipe uh, front to back and not back to front because we don't want anything from the rectum going into the urethra. And especially, you know, after having sexual relations, always, you know, wash up, make sure you're wiping uh, front to back and uh, keeping yourself clean because a um, bladder infection is not fun and a kidney infection is even more not fun. So stay sanitary, ladies. So the urinary bladder is composed of three layers. We have that inner mucosa made up of the transitional epithelium that we saw in our histo slides. And then it has that thick muscular called the detrusor muscle. So the detrusor muscle, important structure that you will be able to identify in lab, it's that thick middle muscular layer of the urinary bladder. And then outside the urinary bladder is this fibrous adventitia. And here we just see the, uh, the, the histological slides of the epithelium of the urinary bladder. Again, um, the transitional epithelium looking like uh, dome-like cells in a relaxed state of the urinary bladder. And once the bladder is full, these cells will flatten and look like squamous cells. But we know that these are transitional epithelium. The urethra is the last structure in the urinary system. The epithelium of the urethra, again, being that transitional epithelium like most urinary system structures. Uh, the epithelium is at the proximal end. Um, transitional epithelium, I'm sorry, at the proximal end or near the bladder. And then uh, within male patients, uh, the epithelium becomes a stratified and pseudostratified columnar epithelium mid-urethra in the males. And then um, at the distal end in males, it becomes a stratified squamous epithelium near the urethral opening. Within the urethra, there is an internal urethral sphincter um, made up of involuntary smooth muscle. And then there's an external or outer urethral sphincter. So there are two sphincters, um, an inner uh, involuntary smooth muscle, internal urethral sphincter, and then an outer external urethral sphincter, uh, which is voluntary. It helps inhibit urination, uh, helps us control our pee, and then this usually relaxes when one has to urinate. Now in females, again, it's shorter. The urethra is shorter. The length is about three to four centimeters. In males, it can be about 20 centimeters in length and has three named regions. So there's the prosthetic urethra. This is the part of the urethra that passes through the prostate gland. There's then intermediate part, um, which is between the prostate and the, uh, the corpus spongiosum of the penis. So this intermembrane or intermediate part, also known as the membranous part of the urethra. This is the part that goes through the urogenital diaphragm. And then finally, we have that third part of the urethra, uh, the spongy penile urethra, which goes through the corpus spongiosum um, and passes through the length of the penis. And here's just a picture of the uh, the female urinary bladder and urethra. So here we can see the middle musculator being the detrusor muscle. Um, within the urinary bladder in the posterior part, you'll see um, a structure called the trigone. The trigone is actually made up of the three orifices of the urinary bladder. So you have two orifices being the internal urethral sphincters. I'm sorry. The two um, 
orifices are the ureteric orifices. These orifices are basically where the ureters uh, will enter the urinary bladder. So you have two coming from the right and left. And then the third orifice is just the, um, the opening of the uh, the internal urethral orifice um, where the um, the urethra starts. So this three-sided structure is called the trigone. Uh, this structure is um, prone to infection um, because we know that you know infection can um, go up the urethra and then enter the urinary bladder. So the trigone is a triangular-like structure made up of the three um, orifices within the urinary bladder. And then from the urinary bladder, we have um, uh, urine will then enter the urethra. Um, surrounding um, the first part of the urethra is the internal urethral sphincter. The sphincter, again, being the muscles that act as um, that basically close off a structure. So the internal urethral sphincter is located there. And then we have an external urethral sphincter. Uh, the external urethral sphincter surrounding uh, this part of the urethra um, that we have voluntary control over when we need to void. We tell this sphincter to relax so that we can pee. So internal urethral sphincter made up of involuntary smooth muscles and then external urethral sphincter is under voluntary control. And here is the uh, male urinary bladder and urethra, and we can see that is, the urethra is a lot longer in males compared to females. Again, here's that trigone structure located in the posterior part of the urethra, I'm sorry, posterior part of the urinary bladder. And then here, um, just above the prostate, is the internal urethral sphincter. Uh, here is the prostate surrounding the prosthetic part of the urethra. Then we have the external uh, urethral sphincter um, surrounding the intermediate or membranous part of the urethra before it turns into the spongy urethra, being in the uh, corpus spongiosum of the penis, and then goes out the external urethral orifice. This is actually kind of cool. This shows... Um, how we pee. Micturition um, is also called voiding or urination. This is the act of emptying the bladder. And this is the, um, the, the signals that are produced within the nervous system that allow us to pee. So first, we feel that our bladder is full. So the bladder becomes full because the kidneys have produced urine and the urine has traveled from the ureters to the urinary bladder. And we have visceral afferent impulses from stretch receptors in the bladder wall, which will then be carried up the spinal cord um, through uh, ascending tracts to the pontine micturition center. Um, pons being part of the brainstem. So the pontine micturition center basically senses that the walls of the urinary bladder are becoming distended because the bladder is full of pee. So at that point, integration in the pontine micturition center, integration just means a processing of the sensory information coming from outside. So the integration in this center then initiates the micturition response. Um, descending pathways will carry this response or impulses to motor neurons in the spinal cord. Um, and then from there, we have parasympathetic efferents that stimulate contraction of the detrusor muscle. So that is uh, here. So we'll initiate or stimulate contraction of the detrusor muscle and open the internal urethral sphincter. Also, we have sympathetic efferents that are inhibited. And then finally, we have somatic motor efferents to the external urethral sphincter. Again, this is voluntary, which are inhibited, and then the sphincter will relax, and then urine will pass through the urethra, and the bladder is emptied.
So we have disorders of the urinary system. We have our UTIs or urinary tract infections, which are again more common in females because of the shorter length of the urethra. This is a burning sensation during micturation, during peeing. Um, ladies, if you sense that you have a UTI, please get it taken care of as soon as possible because we don't want that infection going up to our kidneys. When you go up to the kidneys, it gets worse. Um, I've actually been hospitalized because of a kidney infection. Um, it's not fun. Next disorder is a renal calculi. These are just, you know, calculi are just fancy names for stones. So these are kidney stones. Um, those are painful to pass. My dad had kidney stones and he said it was the most painful thing he's ever experienced besides, and he's had shingles. Uh, another disorder is bladder cancer. This is, makes up 3% of cancers and are more common in men. Uh, kidney cancer uh, rises from the epithelial cells of the uriniferous tubules. Just a recap of the urinary system throughout life. We know that the embryo develops three pairs of kidneys. There's the pronephros, the mesonephros, and the metanephros. Now only the metanephros will persist to become the adult kidney. Uh, the metanephric kidney produces urine by fetal month three and will also contribute to the volume of amniotic fluid. So just uh, a picture of the urine, uh, the uh, fetus and the different parts of the, uh, the embryonic urinary system. And here's that allantois, uh, which eventually will become the urochus. So we have the mesonephros, the mesonephros nephric duct, and then the metanephros, which is what will eventually become the kidneys. By week seven, we can see uh, the metanephros or the kidney, um, and the urogenital sinus uh, becomes the urinary bladder. And by week eight, we can definitely see um, kidneys along with ureters that will drain into the urinary bladder. So um, before we get into advancing age, uh, we want to talk about potty training. Um, with regards to potty training or, um, you know, bathroom training, at about 15 months, toddlers are aware of having voided. And by 18 months, most children can hold their urine for about two hours. And this is usually the first sign to start potty training. Um, we know that daytime control is achieved well before nighttime control. However, it is unrealistic to expect complete nighttime control before four years old. Those with kids, you would know. Um, so kidney and bladder function will decline with advancing age. We know that nephrons decrease in size uh, and number. Uh, tubules are less efficient at secretion and resorption. Filtration also declines. Uh, recognition of desire to urinate is delayed. Um, and then we have loss of muscle tone in the bladder. And other common age-related problems include incontinence, uh, as well as urethral uh, constriction by an enlarged prostate in male patients. So these are all things that occur with aging. Okay, and that is the chapter on the urinary system.